pleasure right now, though, to introduce our speaker for this evening, who is uh, Dr. Milton L. Cofield. Dr. Cofield grew up in Louisiana, went to Southern University, graduated magna cum laude, was off to Champaign, Urbana, to the University of Illinois, where he got a PhD in physical science. Uh, Dr. Cofield is the is now the Vice Chancellor of the Board of Regents in New York State. And uh, just to tell you a little bit about the Board of Regents. Uh, the Board of Regents, which is the head of what is called the University of the State of New York, uh, dates to 1784. Now, some of you uh, have probably better memory of uh, elements of American history than others, but you might recognize that that's three years before the United States Constitution. So this is a venerable institution. And the University of the State of New York, in fact, uh, with the Republicans at its head, oversees all education in New York State, elementary, secondary, uh, higher, what we think of as, as, let's say, community colleges, uh, upper division colleges, all higher education, all professional education, all graduate school education, uh, proprietary, the for-profit education sector, museums and libraries. Uh, it, is, it is singularly unique in this country, and I would imagine in, in probably most, if not all, countries because of the, uh, the, the nature of that chart. <coughs> uh, after uh, Dr. Cofield graduated from the uh, University of Illinois, though, he, he went to East of Kodak, that giant uh, uh, multinational uh, yellow box in Rochester, New York, and uh, spent uh, several years as a scientist there. Uh, he then went and got an MBA at the, uh, at the uh, famous Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, and at that point, he decided to make a career change and went to work with uh, Dr. John Mandewettering, who was the president at uh, State University of New York at uh, nearby Brockport. Uh, he was assistant to the president there for several years, then became distinguished professor at RIT, the Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, and after several years there, in Fulbright uh, scholarships, where he went to uh, Taipei in Taiwan and uh, in the Philippines, he became the uh, executive uh, Executive Director, I was thinking Executive Dean there, but Executive Director of the undergraduate program at the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University. And he is going to address our primary uh, conference theme here this evening, but of course he's bringing a different perspective because even while he is the uh, Executive Director of the, of the school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, He's serving in this very, very high-level position here in New York State, and will come to us bringing us some thoughts as a senior executive, uh, senior executive educator in the state of New York. Could you help me in welcoming please, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Thank you so much for that long introduction. Uh, in looking over your program, I actually am a little jealous because I wish that I had had more time to spend with you. I think the things that you have been talking about based on the subjects of the various sessions that you conducted over the last few days are exactly the kinds of things that uh, I'm very much interested in, both professionally and personally. I want to bring you all a warm welcome from the New York State Board of Regents. My colleagues and I do have a unique position with regard to education in New York State. Uh, the regions do have authority over all education at all levels in New York State, both public, private, and proprietary, and that is very unusual. In addition, we are the licensures of 48 separate uh, professions, and we are the discipline body of those professions. So in the case that someone who is a uh, nurse or a veterinarian or even in the case of physicians, which we do not discipline, we are the body to which a disciplined uh, physician would have to report if they would like to have their license restored. 
New York, as you well know, is one of the most diverse states in the United States and has been for uh, quite some time. Uh, and a great part of the diversity of this state is the diversity that's represented by the Asian citizens of the United States, representing many of the countries from which you are coming. Our Board of Regents really wants to uh, welcome you in, in that regard. Um, a little bit about myself, I, I was a Fulbright Scholar in Taiwan, and uh, I was a Fulbright American Studies Scholar at De La Salle University uh, in the Philippines in 2001. And I have been involved in my own professional life with uh, the beginning of the Carnegie Mellon University campus in Qatar. And uh, I, in my job as head of the undergraduate business program at Carnegie Mellon, I actually have oversight responsibility uh, over that program. Uh, I get to travel the world a little bit and get a lot of frequent travel involved, but I also get to be deeply involved uh, in the issues that we're talking about. I teach global business uh, and international management as my own professional uh, areas of expertise. I want to talk to you just a little bit first about the region's role in higher education. And the reason I want to start there is what I hope to do, I looked at your conference program, and I said what I might say to you that I think would be interesting is to give you a little bit of at least my own thoughts about what I see as the challenges that our education will indeed have in the future. But the challenges that I want to talk to you about are the challenges related to the ideas of your conference, which are the challenges of building partnerships in the future, and what the landscape for our education looks like uh, in the future. Um, the regions have had a long-standing interest in global education. The regions are an accrediting body. We accredit higher education institutions. And uh, one of the institutions that we are quite proud of being the accreditor for is we are the accreditor of the University, the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, and we have been since the founding of that institution. Um, our role in higher education is to make sure that the state of New York has a vibrant higher education community that meets the state's needs. I know that is a role that is similar to the roles that you all have in the countries that you represent. Uh, in order to do this, we have to make certain that the institutions of this state create new knowledge. The reason we have to make sure that that happens is that the future of higher education is increasingly more directly tied to the economic prosperity of the states in which these institutions exist. In fact, I doubt if there's a day that goes by that even at the federal level, the warnings go out about uh, our continued economic prosperity in this country. And again, I'm sure this message is true in your countries. Depends upon us having a vibrant higher education community that delivers to this state and this nation uh, citizens who are capable of helping grow our economy, but also citizens who are kept capable of, of helping to sustain our democracy. We want to prepare students for the opportunities of today and the present needs of the state of the state while ensuring that we continue to have great academic programs in the art, sciences, and the professions that are needed to provide the services and the creative opportunities that our citizens require to fully participate and enjoy the benefits of society and to help others to be well in their health and their spirit and to be prepared for the shared responsibilities of citizenship. Um, we are also required to provide master planning for education in New York State, and that's master planning for the higher education community. And in this role, uh, we try to give thoughtful consideration to the variety and the extent of higher education institutions, the variety of programs, the locations, and also to speak forcefully to our state's leaders about the needs for resources to support this so that higher education can be made available in a form and an equitable manner 
and uh, providing input to the state's consideration of the efficiency and the effectiveness with which higher educational resources are being used throughout the state. So we have a very broad role uh, that we play in higher education. As I say, we have this role not with regard to the public institutions, not with regard to K through 12, but we have this role with regard to all institutions of education in New York State, public, private, uh, or proprietary, which is the uh, for-profit sector. I do want to talk to you about these globalizing concepts or partnerships. And I want to alert for you if you're not already aware of many things that are happening, many of which I believe will directly affect you in your country as they are already beginning to affect us in this country and already provide significant challenges to the regions in executing their responsibilities uh, for higher education. When you consider uh, partners in the future, one of your greater issues that you are going to face is going to be related to this economic development issue. Do you have partners that support the interests of your countries for their own economic development goals? Are you developing jointly with those partners programs that uh, help them to grow economically as well as helping to your partner, uh, partners to grow? Uh, economically. I, I think that's a, a fundamental change. Most of what has been going on relative to trying to get people to be interested in, in international education has been about uh, stimulating some form of person exchange. But quite frankly, the issue of person exchange is probably, uh, interestingly enough to me, the least important issue about developing partnerships uh, globally today. People, students, I think there's well over two and a half million students who are studying in other countries throughout the world. The idea of where you can be and when you can be there uh, is an idea that has uh, made the travel and the technology that enables that has made the idea that our students can have experiences abroad somewhat uh, easy for them, quite frankly, to have. And now I think we have to think at a deeper level about what those experiences are supposed to do both for them, for our institutions, and again, for the societies from which we come. So partnerships are no longer limited to the physical transport of students through the study of art, but they are increasingly about aligning goals and sharing our knowledge generating uh, capacity with our partners. Learning is a global and a universal activity. Programs and uh, delivery systems through your partnerships now have to be more strongly aligned with these economic development uh, goals. As I said, more than 2.5 million students are studying outside of their home countries, and estimates are that that will rise to 7 million as early as 2020. Not just coming to your program, but coming to your partnership. Increasingly, the interest of the students will be about what does your partnership offer them about their educational experience, which is beneficial to them about their uh, career goals. Cost concerns are a major issue that will continue to be a significant impact on higher education, and new models and opportunities uh, for the economic interest in education uh, must be developed. It's important to guard against protecting the system versus maximizing these new learning technologies and modalities. And innovation is clearly an important issue that we all have to think about as you think about how you're developing these partnerships and the goals that you have for them. I want to speak uh, now about the three sectors of education that I see uh, developing. Um, you might say three, uh, you already heard about three, but I'm going to introduce one to you that I think uh, may have a significant impact on you. I want to talk about the public sector of education and what is going on there. Globally, the concept of public universities, primarily funded by the government, are on the decline, both internationally and domestically. When I say that they're on the decline, what I mean is that government funding for education in just this state of New York 
he has been on the decline for almost 30 years. Uh, I spoke earlier to uh, the president and I said to him that it is, at least in my judgment as a state official, unreasonable for any of us to think that the solution to our problems in education are going to be that the government is going to fund us out of the issues that we have. In fact, what we see again globally is that governments are withdrawing their support from public education. I, I was reading today about Greece in the newspaper and I was wondering in my own mind, what does that mean about their public education institutions when their nation is uh, literally almost uh, bankrupt? The largest opportunity for public education uh, it still remains in the area of research and development and the development of new knowledge. And I think that that funding and its important to economic development will not go away. And I believe that that is an important area for you to consider as you are strengthening and reinvigorating and inventing new partnerships. Uh, how can they, again, work towards um, increasing the vitality of, um, of, of the economy of, of countries. Increasingly, universities are being driven to new partnerships with private non-educational organizations. And public universities are also doing that. Uh, most of these partnerships have not been as successful as you might imagine, though, because the goals for them <coughs> about driving economic development. You know, in this state, SUNY has a plan. It says that it's a master uh, plan to develop the state's economy. But in truth, when we look at other than the spending of the state university, we actually see uh, not as much impact at actually creating new business, creating new jobs, creating new opportunities for our citizens. So it's a still a challenge, although this partnership idea of the public universities with private, now I'm talking about private, for-profit entities, largely corporations, I believe that that will continue to be an important issue for public universities uh, going forward. I believe some of your partnerships will probably have to be structured around this kind of idea where global corporations that are important in the countries from which you come, as well as are important here, want you to develop partnerships that support their interests uh, throughout the world. And I think actually that might be uh, a very interesting uh, idea. Um, in the private sector, um, and here, I want to put the private sector to be both the for-profit sector of private education and the not-for-profit sector of higher education. I know many of you are from private institutions and do not like to be lumped together with your for-profit brethren, but I believe that you need to look at these issues uh, in a similar kind of vein. The definition and approach of private sector shows much more diversity and intent in their purpose than the public sector does. What am I talking about? Aggressive action is what you see in the private sector institutions to go out and establish partnerships or foreign operations. The number of American universities that now have campuses or programs jointly shared with other <coughs> universities in other countries or on their own is just on the rapid rise, as I told you. My own university has an extensive program in Qatar, but it's also in Greece, Australia, South Africa. Uh, in talking with the president of Cuba, I just learned that uh, they have more students studying abroad in China than any other university uh, does. So I think the aggressiveness with which the public part, the private part of the university sector engages in partnership activities is much more aggressive than uh, in the public sector. On the other hand, globally, the private sector of education is much less developed. In many of your countries, uh, you might have private institutions, but they do not parallel exactly the structure of the private educational institutions uh, in this state uh, and in this country. So it, it's more a uh, universally less developed more variety and diversity in it, uh, again, acts quicker, uh, I believe will be a challenge for the public sector. 
This has made for a much more complex and evolving higher education institution. For example, the private educational sector is increasingly involved in relationships with, again, private sector institutions to both train people in their corporations and to offer degree programs uh, for the employees of their corporation. Uh, Walmart uh, announced a partnership with the American Public University, which is a for-profit institution in which this institution will award uh, develop academic programs and award degrees in two or three fields, supply chain management and some other business uh, entities. And Walmart has committed itself to spending more than $50 million over three years in tuition uh, assistance for its employees who enroll in these programs uh, worldwide. Um, in my judgment, this kind of partnership, uh, there are others, I'm not going to even mention some of them, one I wanted to, but it's actually an issue under active discussion in the regions for approval in New York State, but what we have is we have increasingly these for-profit private institutions entering into contractual relationships with uh, corporations to provide the entirety of what their educational need is. I think that is something that, again, we all need to be thinking about. What does that mean of our institutions uh, in the future? Privates have more flexibility and have been more aggressive, especially in the United States and increasingly in Western Europe. For example, private, not-for-profit, uh, have been aggressive in creating international partnerships with other universities, locations on their own, uh, with private partners, predominantly in management education, but in many other fields, and predominantly at the graduate level, and largely focused in Asia, where uh, most of the research and development monies of large manufacturing corporations are now being spent in Asia as they move research and development to uh, various countries where their manufacturing facilities were. Again, many of these are in your countries, uh, and these will be the organizations with which uh, you can build partnerships and with which you can build stronger partnerships with your American university counterparts who may be involved in similar things. The challenge that I see, though, is that something else is ha happening out in the world of higher education. And that is something that I am calling the open university concept. Now, many of you might say, oh, the open university, isn't that that British school that lets anybody in? Uh, that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is increasingly uh, entities that are not even, in many cases, organized as not-for-profits. They are just organized as sources of information that increasingly we have more of these entities that are providing educational resources to people. There is something called the Khan Academy, which has almost the entire K-12 uh, educational curriculum of our states that are available in videotape format or interactive format where students can learn physics, chemistry, etc. Now I'll tell you, almost in every case when there's a significant new innovation, people say this innovation cannot take the place of the things that already exist. Uh, as you heard earlier, I worked for a very large photographic company. Uh, I started working this company in October of 1979. In the very month in which I started work, the Sony Corporation introduced a digital camera called the Matvika. And for the next 10 or 15 years, this corporation that I worked for said, this camera will never replace film. I noticed today as I went, uh, I stopped over by the falls uh, just for a second, you cannot buy film in Niagara Falls at the, at the uh, tourist center. You could buy a single-use camera, but you cannot buy a film to put in a film-based camera. You could buy a digital camera over there, but you cannot buy a film. I, I'm telling you that I believe my ideas about what is the threat, if you will, that these open concepts really might have 
uh, to both public and private uh, education is much more significant than people are imagining them to be. Um, for example, the University of the People, this is a non-accredited organization, uh, delivering free uh, higher education resources to anyone who wants it. Uh, the New York Times article discussing this says that uh, there are people in Haitian uh, tech cities who are studying at the, um, the University of the People in the courses there. Now, you might say that by itself might not mean anything, but here's what's happened. That the University of uh, the People, an unusual nonprofit online school, offering free courses to students around the world in business and computers, computer science, is starting a new partnership with NYU, New York University. And in this partnership, New York University will take the very best students who go to this free University of the People and it will admit them to its degree granting programs in its recently started campus in Abu Dhabi. Now, NYU, in my mind, has a clear purpose here. It wants to get really good students in this new university that it's just starting in Abu Dhabi. And it basically is saying, we will take these students from wherever we can get them from. But when it partners with an institution like this Open University of the People, this gives credibility at a very high level to what this University of the People is doing. Eventually, this institution itself already has goals that it will apply for institutional accreditation to award degrees, and at least right now, it says that its mission is to provide this in a free format. Um, this new partnership shows ex uh, uh, an ex uh, exceptional promise, uh, at least for a year of study the, the student only has to study in the University of the People for one year, and then they can apply to that uh, NYU Abu Dhabi campus and get significantly enhanced financial aid for those who are the most successful at doing that. You know, in our state, we, uh, now I'm talking about New York State, we struggle with how to introduce online education even in K-12, and uh, we have the notion that we can't replace teachers, and I understand the concern there, but every day when I go online, I see that there are regents, uh, instructional programs not delivered by us, delivered by someone else who has uh, developed them for themselves, training for the regents exam, in some cases delivered by us, in some cases not delivered by us. Uh, I believe that if you look at all of this in totality, uh, this changing dynamic is something that I don't think we can continue to uh, ignore. Open University, that Open University is more than one entity, but it's a growing uh, movement and belief that information is available to people and that it should be available to people in any format that will help them to learn. I want to tell you a story about the janitor who cleans my office. He came to me one day last week and he said he was watching a show on TV about, uh, I'm going to use my words because I'm a scientist, black hole physics. And he started telling me about uh, gravitational pull of black holes and uh, how massive planetary objects warp space in their vicinity and warp time. He asked me, why do they call it space time anyway? So he, this guy, by the way, he also told me, he said, I failed all of these things in school, <laughs> okay? But he says, no, if I see any of this on TV, he says, I just get interested in that stuff. I saw a television program on the solar system developed on public television provided by NOVA. And in my judgment as a scientist, I said, any person who is beginning their study of the solar system ought to see this TV program first. The information content in it was so high and so good, I just can't imagine how someone can engage students better than that particular TV program actually could engage people. Um, 
So these entities that are out there, these people who want to develop these free resources and say that this is the right of people to have these free resources, I don't believe they're going to go away. I believe they're going to increase, and I believe that some of them are going to become more legitimized as they are able to deliver higher value to the people who are using them. Um, this is a rapidly growing area of, uh, of concern. The issues uh, that all of these things pose to us uh, as uh, regents in New York State is how do we provide the regulatory oversight that is our responsibility to ensure that the citizens of the state are receiving quality in their educational experiences. In many cases, when the entity is providing large parts of what their educational experiences are about are not in this state, and in other cases in which the relationships by which this education is being provided to people is actually of a contractual nature. So do we really have the authority to go in and to tell the Walmart employees in Buffalo that they will need to have their degree program certified with us in some kind of way when their corporate entity has invested $50 million and said that this is where we should go. I know that you know something about supply chain management and you know something about Walmart and I can only tell you that in my mind that a person who gets a degree from anywhere that's about supply chain management and works for Walmart, that that is going to be a credible educational experience. It will be viewed so by others uh, in who are in other organizations. And increasingly, what I'm saying, we are also going to have to accept it as a very credible uh, experience. The role of these corporate partners uh, in defining how one evaluates the quality of education is only going uh, to increase. Education is the driving force for innovation, and we see that, and we witness it every day. And we, all of us, in all of our jobs, wherever we are, have to make sure that we are actually uh, paying attention to being actively involved in utilizing, evaluating, assessing uh, the new things that are happening and developing partnerships with each other that literally strengthen us against the variety of different kinds of forces and issues that I think are on the rise, not just in higher education, but for sure in higher education, but in every level of education. You know, I already see the day when the employee who had a bad experience in our K-12 system, but finds out that they can learn very effectively online or in some other format, goes home and says they don't understand why their children are not learning this way. That will put a pressure on us that we are not uh, used to have. Um, so I actually just want to conclude here. I know you have been talking about all of these issues and many more, but I want to just lay for you that now is not the time for us to rest on the partnerships that we have built. Now is the time for us to think about the partnerships that we will need to build and the ways in which we will have to strengthen the partnerships that we already have so that we all continue to remain to be an important part, the important part that we have already played uh, in higher education in all of our countries and uh, throughout the world. I, I will take some questions if we have some time for that. I know you've had a long day and many things going on, but I'm very interested in this and would be more than happy to be engaged with you. Yes, please. Just so everybody can hear, I'm Judy Kirkpatrick. I'm the provost at Unicorn College, and I want to applaud your, your speech tonight. It was absolutely right on about the future of higher education and what we need to be looking at. That said, as a you at the college, we have 22 graduate programs, and I know a number of the institutions here represented still have the name college because New York State requires to be called a university, you have to have three PhD programs. We're not going to have PhD programs. We're very proud of the fact that we have 
the mix of professional. They do have doctoral programs, but they are professional doctorates. In the world today, college means high school. For us to develop partnerships, by being in New York State right now, we're being held back by the fact that we can't use the university status. And as I said, what you're saying, you are so right on about the future of higher education. How can you help us? So, you know, uh, I, I tried to put the regents in the heart of this matter. Our regulatory structure, many of the things that we have held to in the past, uh, we are going to have to re-examine these things. The use of the title of the university, I think we are going to have to re-examine that. The seat time required to demonstrate competency uh, of knowledge in courses, we're going to have to re-examine that. Um, these are going to be serious challenges to us because they have many far-reaching consequences that are not easy for us to see what they are. If a kid really can demonstrate because they watch the same programs that Russ did, that they know uh, high school astronomy and pass our competency examinations, et cetera, are we actually really going to continue to mandate that they spend another 30 or 40 weeks working on that particular subject matter area? So to, to your specific question, uh, what I really want to say to you is that these are going to be challenging times for the people who have the responsibility of oversight of education, the regents, and you. We would love to work with you on this. Okay. <laughs> yes, please. Well, the thing that you said for the university, Dr. Wilson, the last week, I, I, I see the, uh, the sentiment uh, that has been expressed. In the Philippines, it's exactly the opposite. We have a lot of colleges, uh, and we have a lot of universities. But on, on, on the one hand, you know, the, 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 uh, the nomenclature, I suppose, has been uh, basically the wrong with you. So because many times when we talk about these colleges and universities, they're basically just glorified high schools. And, and, the, and you, you, can, you can see that very much in, in the products that the graduates are produced. Because you find out after going through about four years or five years of uh, undergraduate program, they end up very much unemployed. There's, there's no work in the industry and uh, the kind of training that they would have had. Uh, so it, it's something that you know we're, we're trying to grapple with at the moment. And uh, I was telling some that uh, right now uh, we're, we're trying to change the educational system, which is basically the American system, that. Uh, that has, uh, for, for a long time, it's really been at 8 to 10. We're, we're probably one of the few countries that still has 10, 10 years for basic education. So we're trying to change that, and we're adding two more years. And that being said, we're, we're seeing how, how the two years is, is going to uh, probably do something about you know making sure that the higher education is is one that is well worth the title that most of most of the universities and colleges in the Philippines have had. So there's one track that would say, well, you have two more years and you give some kind of training for the for the students so that they get they get some skills so that they can be gainfully employed after two years. Uh, and then that becomes almost terminal. And then the other two years would be, you know, you bring down some of the liberal arts course or the general education program into the two years so that by the time they finish two years, say to 12, then they would be ready to go to the, technically to the university. And the way we look at it, at, at least, you know, in our understanding, you know, for someone to go to the university, it's really basically the research, the research dimension of uh, what the university is all about. Uh, something which it is not is not fully understood. You, you know, my, that's my uh, 
you, you bring up a lot of issues. Um, I'm going to start with the one about your increasing the, the 10 to 12 years. Um, so actually what we see, at least in our high performing schools in the U.S. right now, is that uh, many of our students literally have finished our normal uh, high school education at the end of 10 years. And many, many students are in the high performing schools for two additional years doing something that is pre-college, that is AP, that is international baccalaureate. Now, I think that that too is going to be a challenge because at the present time that's being sold uh, primarily as an advantage to the person who wants to go on to college, but the cost of it is being funded through the local school system. Um, I think if the local school system Again, my vision of the economic future of how states are going to support education is that I don't think they're going to give more money to the support of education. I think they're going to ask us for higher levels of efficiency. I think that could have an impact on that part of what, whether or not 10 years or 12 years, the seat time issue I mentioned, other things, it could really have a, a, an impact on that. You also mentioned that um, Many of the entities, and, and I can really understand the concern of musical college, that continue to use the title of college, even in this state, uh, quite frankly, they come from the proprietary sector. And some of them, I have to be careful on the state official here, uh, they are not very strong. Uh, they are also very occupationally oriented. Now, I think all of us have had to accept that having a purpose for education is something that our publics are increasingly asking us to be responsible for to them. Uh, partly, I say, especially in the private sector and even in the public, as the cost skyrockets, people want to know what am, I, what am I buying and what am I getting for the dollars that I'm spending, and they're not accepting broad philosophical statements of outcomes. They want something tangible, and quite frankly, uh, they want this return on investment, quite frankly, is, is the way I would really put it to you. I think that's a pressure that colleges and universities are, are adapting to and have not had to respond as directly as, as they have to respond to today about uh, what is that cost structure? So that naming thing, I think, and a part of that in New York State, why we've been so resolute is that, uh, on the one hand, I very much appreciate what you were saying, but on the other hand, I'm not sure we want to open the door and allow every one of these entities that you are now saying might be very occupationally oriented high school. We, I don't think we necessarily want them to be called university either. Uh, we have to make clear to the public what is the, what is it that they're consuming when they choose A over B. Please. I'm Marco Firstly, I'd like to comment about the college and the university resources. I think that uh, we also, even if we came from the Northeast and we also said that there are also many private colleges in the country, like Edwards, like William and Mary. So I think that the uh, college and university doesn't mean that uh, one has a higher quality than the other. Uh, secondly, I would also like uh, to, to elaborate a little bit more about the new kind of university that we have in the that is open to the people. Uh, what is the legal basis of this university? Whether this university is the state of New York or not? And could you compare to like the older one, like the University of Sydney, and compare it to the other traditional universities? Because I'm very, I think that the state is very interesting. I feel also not want to be the same. Yes. So, so, so that idea that I tried to introduce under the name of Open University, I'm really trying to talk about uh, a structure in which 
uh, increasingly people are providing, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll to be honest with you, very rich content materials online that are being developed by persons who are not in, uh, they're not even uh, often in the entire educational establishment. They are people completely outside of the educational establishment who say uh, there's no reason why we cannot provide this very high level content material to anyone uh, who wants it. These people develop these uh, content on their own uh, at the present moment, and I said at the present moment, they are working under a model of no cost. They are not accredited. They simply are operating in basically the online space, but they are saying increasingly that they are there, and they are saying they have this kind of content. More and more people are going to them evaluating their content on their own, deciding that they can learn from this content, and, uh, and using that for their learning reasons. Now, the thing I try to bring out here is that, because you're asking me, who regulates that? At the present time, no one regulates that. It's like a web page. It's like, you can create any web page you want to create. No one is regulating that. Where the, I think the regulatory issue is going to come into play, and I think pretty soon, is for example, in this partnership between NYU and this Open University of the People. So the Open University of the People is a completely non-accredited uh, entity that NYU is saying, if you do well in that, we'll accept you. Okay, well, uh, NYU has its own accountability for demonstrating that the credits that students are awarded in their university are valid and legitimate and all of those other things. So, so they bear some responsibility, but this open university of the people, the only responsibility it has is will somebody else accept that? I'm saying <laughs> that's already a beginning when a university like that accepts that. I'm saying what if uh, what if Walmart accepts that? Then I think we will have a greater challenge to stand in the way and say this content is not good, this instructional methodology is not good, these students are not learning what we could teach them in our universities. If employers accept it, and if other institutions accept it, I think there's only a certain amount of time before it becomes more and more legitimate. I think that's the concern. And we, on the regions, as the state's authority to regulate education, and your question is very pertinent to us. What is our role? What should we say? I don't think we should be saying that we should be trying to hide the idea that the Open University of the People exists, or that we should be hiding from our citizens that Khan Academy exists, or that we should be hiding from our citizens that any of this other content that's being developed uh, exists. I don't know that we are validating it right now, and I don't know that we are thinking about how even we could use it more advantageously to meet our broader uh, educational goals. I think that's what our challenge really is. Any other yes. burning question? Yes, sir. I, I think the greater challenge there, though, is that you know you have you have this new model of learning, and that people are learning. Yes. Whereas in the traditional form, they are not learning as much as as they should. So. That, I, I suppose you, know, you, you present a new model by which people get to learn in, in a much better way. And, and that should put the traditional, traditional form of education in question. And I think it is. You know, I'll tell you about this, one of my own experiences in my class. I used uh, YouTube video snippets in my class. And uh, I have found 
through my research, uh, two things. One is, if I assign one of these five minute videos in my class, the students report to me, they don't just look at the video I gave them, they look at a lot of videos because I can't find just one video. I give them a search screen and there's other stuff that's there and they say, oh, I looked at that and it only took three or four minutes and what you said, they're like my janitor. They're saying, I actually got something out of that. Let me look at something else. Uh, I think there's great opportunity in this and again, I experienced this in my class. My students come to class more engaged in dialogue with me about the things I want to be in dialogue with them about. Better informed. I think, again, that's why we shouldn't be trying to figure out how to stop all these things. We should be trying to understand how we can use these things to accomplish the legitimate goals that, that we already have. I think I'm getting the hook, but you get the yeah. last question. Can I discuss the university of the people versus public versus private? Do you think access to higher education is a privilege or a right? Mm -hmm. So that's a very good question. <laughs> I have to take a couple of minutes. <laughs> so, so here's, here's I'm, I'm going to get to that answer, okay? But, but here, here's what I think, at least in, in the U.S., uh, we have a challenge. If we were to declare it to be a right, um, then I think the problems that we see when we have uh, anywhere from 20 to 60 percent graduation rate in our colleges and universities, which all isn't determined by what the students knew. Uh, uh, no, we know there are many other factors that ultimately lead to dropout. But we also know that a significant amount of that is lack of proper preparation of those students for the educational programs that they actually are going into. When you make it uh, too heavily lean in the right category, then I think you run the risk, and I think there are clear examples of where not only has the risk been run, but, but it's been overrun, of diminishing the quality of the experience for students who are prepared and, and, and can learn uh, the material of college. So I think you need some kind of structure that says who may have some degree of access to higher education. So that makes it look a little bit more uh, like a, 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 a privilege uh, than a right. And I think we have to have a balance on that. I, I, I think if you just go in one direction or the other, right without a responsibility is not any good. Uh, and overprivilege is not good for a democratic society. Thank you.